Scary Mysteries, Twisted Twos, Jennifer and June Gibbons, and Girl in the Cornfield. Tales of hauntings, murder, and scary mysteries. Every week, Twisted Twos dives into a pair of uniquely terrifying true stories that are worthy of a more in-depth look. For this week, we focus on the strange relationship between a pair of twins and the murder mystery of the girl in the cornfield. Get ready for Scary Mysteries, Twisted Twos. Number 1. Jennifer and June Gibbons Known as the Silent Twins, the tale of Jennifer and June Gibbons is a unique one. Born in 1963 to Caribbean immigrants, they were identical twins who were practically inseparable. Shortly after being born in Yemen, the family moved to Haverford, West Wales. Being the only black children at school made the girls a target for bullying, forcing them to become more attached to one another as they steered clear from other children. Speaking in their Bahan Creole, the two soon only communicated with each other. Their language evolved and soon it was unintelligible to other people. After a long time living like this, they stopped speaking to everybody else altogether with the exception of their sister Rose. Once the girls turned 14, they met with therapists hoping to get them to break their silence. People also tried separating them, but instead of thriving, the girls became catatonic. There was no choice but to reunite them and for years, the two isolated themselves inside their bedrooms. They wrote in their diaries all the time and created elaborate plays, short stories, and soap operas, often recording them on tapes and giving those to their sister. In 1979, they took a mail-order creative writing course and began writing more elaborate short stories. But these stories were violent and alarming. One of them featured a boy obsessed with Pepsi soda who was seduced by a teacher. Another story is of a disco dance party that incites patrons to become violent. Still, yet another tells of a physician who kills a dog to obtain its heart and transplants it into his daughter. Usually, despite their close relationship, the girls carried a lot of animosity and violence for one another. Their diary entries talk of being a burden to each other and expressing loathing towards the other twin. As their stories became dark, the behavior also turned sinister. The sisters began drinking and using drugs. Both would break into houses and steal. It culminated in Jennifer trying to strangle June at one point and June trying to drown Jennifer. The two also committed arson, setting fire to a tractor. Afterwards, they escalated by vandalizing and attempting to set fire to a technical school. They were arrested and subsequently sent to the Broadmoor Hospital a notorious mental facility in Berkshire, England. The girls remained in Broadmoor for 14 years. Normally, as delinquents, they were supposed to only serve two years, but according to June, later on, they were held for so long because they refused to speak. Both of them were put on high doses of antipsychotics while held there. Over time, they were able to adjust and even join the hospital choir. One journalist named Marjorie Wallace became intrigued with their case and started to interview the girls. She found out that they were mostly unresponsive unless asked about their writing. Marjorie requested that the twins be transferred to a less foreboding institution. However, one disturbing pact that they never let go of was that if one of them died, the other was to go and start speaking and living a normal life. Before leaving Broadmoor, the twins had already agreed at least one of them needed to die and it was Jennifer who decided to give up her life. While well, the girls were being transferred to Caswell Clinic in March of 1993, Jennifer became unresponsive upon arrival. Even though medics attempted to save her, she soon died. It was determined she passed away from a heart inflammation. In the autopsy, no drugs were found in her system, and there was no suspicion of foul play. Her death is a complete mystery even now. True to their promise, though, June began talking and integrating herself into society after her sister's death. She even gave out interviews to different magazines, and in one, she's quoted as saying, I'm free at last, liberated, and at last, Jennifer has given up her life for me. June has since moved back to Wales and is no longer under psychiatric care. She lives alone, occasionally interacts with the community, yet still visits her sister's grave every week. Number 2 girl in the cornfield. 
On November 10, 1979, a farmer looking out saw something red in his cornfield. Thinking he caught a trespasser, he went to investigate it, but as he approached, he found the remains of an unidentified female sprawled across his cornfield in Caledonia, New York. The girl had a petite frame. She was found wearing tan corduroy jeans and a red men's windbreaker jacket. A popular vending machine keychain was hanging on her belt loop, and she was wearing a simple necklace. Police found out she was shot twice, once over her right eye, dragged to the cornfield, and then shot again in the back. There were no signs of sexual abuse. However, there were indications the killer took time to remove identifying marks on her before dumping the remains. When police asked around, a waitress from a nearby diner said she saw the victim with a white male. She described this man as being between 5'8 and 5'9, and he wore black wire-rimmed glasses. They were eating together, and he paid for her dinner. The man was also described as driving a tan station wagon. Although a sketch was released, this individual has never been identified and is currently a person of interest in the case. Through advances in technology, there were multiple times when the body was exhumed and re-examined in hopes of being able to identify the victim. Her DNA was profiled, hoping it would be used as comparison to a family member or used in the case at some point. For 35 years, the body was dubbed as Caledonia Jane Doe or Callie Doe since no one was able to identify her or find anything that led to her identity. Around 2015, Laura Noel, a Florida native, went on Facebook to look for her long-lost childhood friend from Brookville, Florida, Tammy Jo Alexander. The two were rambunctious teens running away from home at some point to head to New York at the age of 15. When Noel couldn't find Alexander, she reached out to Alexander's half-sister, Pamela Dyson, hoping to find out what happened to her friend. Dyson said Alexander often ran away because of an unhealthy life at home, but discovered no one in her family knew where she was at all. The two thought it was possible Alexander became a victim of crime and checked with the records at the county sheriff, but they realized no missing persons report was ever filed for her. Even though Dyson insisted her parents did file the report because of the repeat runaway antics of Alexander, it was possible that authorities didn't take it seriously. So Dyson and Noel ended up filing a new report. A short time after it was posted, the report came to the attention of web sleuth moderator Carl Koppelman from California. An amateur forensic specialist, he and others have been attempting to solve cold cases online. In 2010, Carl had created a composite sketch of the Caledonia Jane Doe, so when he read the missing persons report in 2014, he immediately realized it could be the same person. He informed the respective agencies about the strong resemblance and in 2015, mitochondrial DNA was examined from Dyson and the Cali Doe. This resulted in a match. The Caledonia Jane Doe was Tammy Jo Alexander. As a result of identifying the victim, several new leads have opened up. The case is still open and police are continuing their investigation. To date, authorities said DNA taken from Alexander's clothing is pointing to three persons of interest. So there were two of the most mysterious and killer stories around. The world can be a crazy place and Twisted Twos is sure to show you why. If you enjoyed this video, then please remember to subscribe and check out some of our other videos we know you'll love. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.